Well, meanwhile, in the Sunday school class, you know, trying to teach a Sunday school lesson, um, we ended up last week looking at some of the characteristics of false teachers in 2 Peter chapter 2. And it's really eight particular characteristics that Peter lists in these first several verses of chapter 2. And we ended up looking at uh, the fifth one in verse 2, which is that false teachers are quite popular, especially among church people. And one commentator noted that teaching that removes the bounds of moral constraint and accountability to a holy judge is always popular to church people. And we had several examples. First Corinthians chapter 5, man living in incest, and the church was proud of it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, the Lord speaks to the church of Thyatira, who has that Jezebel who is teaching the servants to commit adultery and immorality. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, people will seek to suit their own desires, and they will be drawn to teachers that appeal to this. And then Luke chapter 6, verse 26, he has, the Lord gave a warning from the past. He says, woe when all people speak well of you. He said, because that's what they did to the prophets of old. And these are just elements of the popularity that comes with false teaching. Comments, questions on that before we move to the next one? Right. False teachers bring disrepute to the way of truth, also in verse 2. And many will follow their destructive ways. This is the New King James Version that I'm reading out of now. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Now, they bring disrepute to the way of truth. The word for disrepute, the Greek word for that is the same word for blaspheme. So, False teachers cause the lost to blaspheme the name and the way of Christ. <clears throat> and the world then holds the gospel in utter contempt. This is the same blaspheme that is used in chapter, 2 Samuel chapter uh, 12, verse 14, when Nathan was speaking to David about his sin, what he had caused those that lived around Israel to say, to see and to say about God. They blasphemed God because of the sin of David. And they do this because of their shameful ways. And that's a New International Version uh, translation of this. But uh, the New King James has many will follow their destructive ways. And NIV says their shameful ways, which I think gives a little better flavor to what the Greek and what the passage is talking about. And false teachers, motivation is greed. Verse 3 tells us, and I'm just kind of going through these. Um, if there's a question or comment, please don't hesitate to stop me. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. So, false teachers, motivation for their erroneous teaching is greed. They want to they make profit from the people they deceive. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 23, you had Simon the sorcerer, who was seen to be a great individual. And when he saw the power of God, he tried to buy it. And once again, you had, you had a greed, you had a motivation for profit out of this. And false teachers fueled their greed through appealing to people's susceptibility to selfish fulfillment. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, and I know that... Matthew or Matt or uh, Andrew 1 will get there in their teaching. But in chapter 4 of Ephesians verse 14, he tells us that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful Plotting. So, you know, this is what Ephesians 4, this is what he's talking about here. This is what Peter is echoing, if you will, uh, the teaching of Paul. 
Televangelists, especially, you know. Uh, there was one, this was a couple years ago, that, that said that the, the, the only thing that was keeping Jesus from coming back to earth for the rapture is the church and people were not paying enough money into the church. And of course, he had his phone number and his way of contact at the bottom of scrolling across the bottom. And, and the man actually said that if people would give more money, the Lord would say to his son, go get them. Profit. Pure greed profit. There isn't a, a multinational company or anything else that is any more greedy than some of these televangelists. And it's easy for people to fall into this. Um, Do you think it's just greed, though? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Because you see a lot of people just want power. And a, a church is a good way to give somebody power mm -hmm. if they get in the wrong position yes. and control so many people. Because a lot of ch church is kind of out of control in a good way. And, you know, missions and relationships and it's nice and everything. So sometimes people that just want power and control, mm -hmm. that's their yeah, yeah, and we've all seen it, and it doesn't have to be a large church. It can be a small church. I've, I've been in some small churches in my lifetime, and there would be a, a cell, if you will, of power. And they thought because they were made a little more money than anybody else in the church or whether they had been there longer or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. That they, that they ought to be listened to and they ought to have control over what's going on. And small churches, you get into a larger church, you have preachers that we, Teresa and I attended a church where it was a very conservative, very good church, but the preacher just had to have his fingers in everything. And if he didn't have some control over it, he was suspicious of it. And, you know, it's it, that sense of, that sense of power, that sense of control, that sense of I am important. And maybe I don't have it in other places in my life. Bless God in the church, I got power, you know. And we've seen this all around. And it's, it is, it's a form of greed because it's a, it's a personal power greed. That people have and and I know I've told you this before but there was a young guy I knew he got saved and, and the church that he eventually pastored before that the church didn't have a preacher at all a little church free will Baptist church if I remember correctly and there was a, a gentleman who was a retired military man and he felt called to preach and he told me he said I don't need any money. I'll just come. I'll pass the church for you if you like. And, you know, you don't have to pay me. I got a house. I got all this. And this will help the church build it, the money back up it needs. So he came and he was, he pastored there for six or eight months. The church began to grow. People began to attend. New folks began to attend. And they ran him off. Because the new people affected the power base within the church. And the the little core cell of people who control things were beginning to lose that because new folks were joining, becoming a part, and they ran him off. I, you know, power is a is a is a powerful thing. You know, uh, it's a powerful seduction in people's lives. <laughs> So, you know, and this is what they show. And one, now one of the things about 2 Peter, and I, I said this in the introduction, 2 Peter is not a happy book. I mean, he's, he's not dealing with happy things here. He's dealing with things that are affecting the, the dedication and the following of, of the congregations to whom he was writing. 
And Peter is, is writing to, to fight this. He, so he, this is not necessarily just a happy book. But the way he describes these false teachers, have you ever seen anybody that had all these characteristics? That you'd look at him and say, yep, there he is right there. Look at it. He's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Joe Lewis. You're pretty close. Yeah. There's a couple others we could probably answer, uh, add to that number. Jim Baker. Yeah. But, um, as he describes these in chapter two, in particular, what he's describing is the internal character of that person. They may be all shiny and smiley on TV or approach you with all this, but this is the internal character of a false teacher. And this is one, these characteristics are how they're able to, as. Paul told Timothy, worm their way in to people that are unstable, people that are don't that are not firmly grounded in Scripture. And so this is the character that he's talking about. And the teachers rely on deceptive words. That's a New King James here in verse 3. They will exploit you with deceptive words. Uh, NIV says stories they have made up. In other words, the stories are the result of the twisting and erroneous interpretation, changing of Scripture. They'll bring out Scripture, but they just twist the understanding of this. And this is how they deceive people. And, you know, this is part of the character of these false teachers. And false, yeah, and the way we can tell the difference from this is simply knowing scripture. Don't have to be a genius. You just have to simply know your, your Bible. If something doesn't sound right, look at it. Look at it in scripture. Even if they give you a scripture, even if I give you a scripture, look at it and see whether it jives. If not, call it out. And, you know, because you want to make sure that what you hear and what you believe is in harmony with the book. And that's an important thing. Now, Peter goes on to say, he says, Thou, for a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Doesn't that sound a little odd when you read that? Peter says they're not going to get away with it. Their judgment has been planned for them a long time. And their, their judgment has been planned the same time as salvation was planned for us from the foundation of the world. God planned their judgment as well as our salvation. And it will certainly come. They're hanging by a thread, but doesn't it seem like that last thread is just really strong? Do you have, huh? Well, I mean, the way I read that, you know, judgment has come, but it's almost like God's long suffering waiting on them to maybe figure it out. That's the way I read it. Yeah, there's certainly God's long suffering. He'll talk about that in chapter three. It's like it's been hanging over them for a long time, mm -hmm. stretching this. It's not been sleeping. It's like, yeah, God it's there. Sees it. God knows what's going on. They're not going to get away with it. Nope. But it's not what it says. You know, it's been hanging over them for, for a long time. Yeah. And it's like the old, the, the old thing about the sword of Damocles, you know, yeah. hanging by a thread and <clears throat> could fall at any time. And certainly it is, it is. And it's the Lord's mercy. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's a mercy from God that false teachers are not exposed, are not brought out and judged so that they might get the point and repent. But it's being stored up at the same time. They're not going to get away with anything. It's being stored up at the same time. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And we talked about it earlier on in in, uh, in in the study. There's so many things that have changed in the church. 50 years ago, none of us would have looked like we look right now sitting in the sunshine class. Yeah, I would I'd have hair, you know, back then. Uh, but you'd be wearing ties. You'd be wearing maybe a white shirt even instead of colored shirts. You would maybe be wearing a suit or something like this. Our dress has changed over the last 50 years in churches. Uh, the way we present the services have been, has changed over the last 50 years. And we talked about it. why can't you change the gospel? If we changed all those things and it's okay, why can't we go ahead and change the gospel? Because that's the word. You can't change the word. You can't change the word. And it's based upon a person, Jesus Christ who describe the way to be accepted to God. And he's already said that. So unless you can go to heaven and get him to change his mind, it ain't, it ain't any different now. Is it possible for a false teacher to bring someone to Christ? Does someone to I think false teachers, say you have a preacher, like Teresa said, they're, they're very close to the truth and they're preaching a message. Their motives may be totally off but the Holy Spirit is able to take the word that is presented, a verse, a scripture, and convict a person's mind and heart and bring them to Christ. He wouldn't be leading them to Christ so much, although he'll probably get credit for it, but the Holy Spirit can use a passage of scripture to deal with the heart and mind and convict a person and bring them to Christ. And thus, the person not being aware can be deceived into thinking that it was that great preacher that did this. So it's, it's, you know, it's easy for us. And I've told you this before. When I first got saved, I was a member of a Baptist church. Little Baptist church. It was um, uh, up out, outside of Chatham, Virginia. Little Baptist church. Dead as four in the morning, but Little Baptist church. I was going there. Got saved in a Pentecostal meeting which is radically different, especially 60 plus years ago. And the, the, the emotion of the people, how they were so glad and just wrapped around me with that, I got snowed into it, willingly. And it was during a revival that we had at the church, at the Baptist church, that I told the preacher and the evangelist, I'm, I'm moving my membership, which didn't exactly make them happy knowing that I was going to a Pentecostal church. But in looking at that, it was, it was all that came with it. The Lord saved me. It was the gospel that was preached that convicted me and saved me, but it was everything else that came with it that helped move me to a place of accepting Pentecostalism rather than our Baptist doctrine. And it took me 20 plus years to kind of get my head straight. And now here I am. I'm just as Baptist as I reckon as anybody else now, you know. Um, and have very little time for Pentecostalism. Uh, but that's a whole different story. But it's easy. It's easy. And that's why Peter is warning about this. It's easy for us to be drawn in and to be deceived. And we have to be aware and understand scripture and have to think about what we hear in light of scripture in order to stand, especially in these days as things are getting more and more deceptive in our world. Well, I think Teresa's really right on that because it's saying I'll be driving on the road listening to something and I'm not the best expert like y'all yeah, like where this is in the Bible is so and so uh, where it is like I could probably get you to the Old Testament or New Testament and then that's about it but um, I just hadn't done you any good in this class I don't know I'll put the Bible on the road because I had to memorize when I was little but anyway but it is true because you're going on the road and I'm listening to something and he almost would be able to rewind it because you can't tell, but like they're doing something and all of a sudden they say something you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you just say? Mm -hmm. That's not right. Yep. That, but you can see the whole thing was right. And 
until that one thing, and then you're like, whoa, 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 mm -hmm. and you want to rewind it, but you can't because you're in the car. Yeah. But that's how good they are. Yeah. And, and even me, I, I can't even tell, and I pretty much read the Bible a lot, but you can't tell that you just know enough to go, whoa, 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 here. That's not quite right. And when the Holy Spirit says, whoa, then you need to dig into it more to be able to find out why you're feeling that whoa. You know, is it just, I didn't hear it right, or is there something really not quite jive? And I heard, of, I heard a well-respected speaker on the radio here a while back, and they were talking, uh, I don't remember what the subject was, but they were, they were in the book of Revelation, and they were talking about the seven candlesticks, and they said, this represents the church. No, it doesn't. It represented the seven churches. Now, believing that is not going to send you to hell, but it may confuse you in understanding the book of Revelation. And, you know, so you have to, you have to listen. One of the things Trisha I know gets angry or upset with me about, we'll be listening to the gospel music going down the highway, and I'll say, I can't stand that song. That is not scriptural. That is, you know, and there's sometimes I'll just turn the thing off and go thing, you know. But, you know, there are nice, light, bright songs and they're being played on the Christian radio station, all this other stuff. Just slip that, you know. Not like a post-tribulation. Uh, no, no, that's, that's gospel. Uh, Pre-tribulation might be, you know, spurious. We'll get into that. <laughs> Yeah, there's a whole lot of songs we sing that really don't jive totally with scripture. We sing them and you can kind of just mm, get by with them sometimes, you know, but uh, but there's a lot of them, you know, and they're well-meaning songs and so forth. They're not going to send you to hell for singing them, but, you know, they are not totally in line with it, you know. And, and it doesn't mean that if you don't agree with me, I'm going to see you as wrong. No. We will disagree. Now, if it comes to the fundamentals of salvation, no, we're, we're, going, to, we're, going, to, we're going to separate there. But there's a lot of things in Scripture that is interpretive. The fundamentals are not interpretive. They are gospel truth. And if you don't believe those, there's a spiritual problem in your life, my life, anybody's life. But there's a lot of things that are interpreted. And there's a lot of different interpretations about them. But that tells us we need to be in the book. Study it. To have, as Peter said in the first, the first epistle, be able to explain why you believe and why you reverence the Lord like you do. Chapter 3, verse 15. Be able to explain that. Be able to explain why you believe, why you act like you do, based upon what? Well, that's what we believe at the church, and that ain't going to cut it. Why do we believe this? That's the important thing. Now, why doesn't God punish some of these people now? Like Ananias and Sapphira and Simon the sorcerer. Why, why doesn't God do that now? We've touched on some of it. God doesn't have to repeat judgment to let you know his attitude. He destroyed the world once in a flood. He didn't have to keep doing that to get the point across that there is judgment that will come. Although Peter will say the next time it's going to be with fire, you know. Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, God doesn't have to keep repeating things to show his attitude. If he's done it once, it remains. He doesn't have to keep explaining himself because he's not like us, changing our minds. Also to prevent believers from living in fear or confusion about God. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. That's the parable of the wheat and tares. 
Man sowed wheat in his, in his field. His enemy came and sowed tares in the field. They both began to grow together. And his servants asked him, said, you want us to go out there and pull them up? He said, no. Because it might destroy the good grain. Wait until the harvest. And then they will be separated. And so for us today, there's some, if God was, if God was to strike everybody who really sinned against him, I, we all, we, this room would be empty in all probability. So to prevent believers from living in fear, God doesn't want you to fear him. He wants you to respect him and know that there's judgment coming for sin, but you don't have to live in fear or confusion about who God is. He doesn't want that. And then to show examples, his examples show enough warning. And we're going to get into these examples right now. Now, verses 4 through 9 are one sentence with three examples of the ways that God's judgment works. And he starts off with, for if God did not spare, verse 4, the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Now, we've had this conversation several times. Now, despite being beings of power, God passed judgment upon them. Even angels are not out of the boundary of God's judgment. Now, what angels is he talking about? Hmm? Is it not the third to the Satan? That's who I think it is. But there's some. That, and there's some, quite a few commentators, surprisingly, say these are the same angels that we looked at in 1 Peter chapter 3. These were angels that fell and had sex with women before the days of Noah. And most commentators, Genesis chapter 6, call these the sons of God. I believe that they're fallen angels that fell with Lucifer. That's recorded in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. A third of the innumerable company of angels fell. I think those are the ones that fell. These are a different group. And let me give you my reasons. Angels are presented as secular speaking. Matthew chapter 22, Mark 12, Luke 20, all three of those chapters presents angels as secular speaking. No angel is ever mentioned in scripture in a sexual manner. So just Gen Genesis chapter six, angels could have sex. That, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in my mind to see that in scripture. And I have a problem believing that more angels fell after those that fell with Lucifer and grew an appendage and were punished again. Well, can't you just go by the names? I mean, the name Michael. I mean, I automatically think they'll angel. By the names of them. Yeah, that, and we I didn't name them. That's a name for them. Oh, yes. See yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, and they were all gods. Lucifer was an archangel. He was one of the, if you will, inner circle and fell and deceived a third of heaven to follow him. That's why he's so good at deceiving people now. He's very learned. He created the idea of deception. And if angels fell after the original fall, does that mean that angels can still fall today? I don't think so. I think you have one shot. I think you have one shot. Because you don't read anywhere else in scripture about angels falling again. There was this one time never repeated. And I just, you know, these are my reasons. And 
If you believe otherwise, that's fine. You're in company with some really good commentators, theologians, and I am not a theologian by any stretch. I won't argue about it. I just, I, for these reasons, it just doesn't make sense to me. If it does make sense to you, then that's fine. I'm good with it. But I think these are angels that fell when Lucifer fell. And what he's talking about here, the angels who sinned, God cast them down to hell. And they were placed in hell. The Greek word here for that is tartarosis or tartarus, as, we use, as you have probably heard in preaching and so forth. And that word talks about being in gloomy dungeons or chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So they were placed in a place of a situation of gloomy dungeon, dungeons and chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Now, Tartarosis refers to a dark subterranean abyss reserved for evil. And the question comes up a lot of times, where is this? What is, what is he talking about here? So, what is this? This isn't the lake of fire. It says they're going to be held for judgment. So where they are now is not the final place of where they're going to be. The place they're going to final, finally be is the lake of fire. Now, the term Tartarus or Tartarusus and or change may refer more to a restraint of movement rather than a location. And that bell out there is restraining my movement. Telling me I, it's time to hush. So we'll talk about this more next week because there's different ideas. And once again, this is, this is one of those areas of interpretation. Huh? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that next week. Huh? Nephilim, the giants, they, they, no, they were the children. No, they were the children of men and women. It was a perverse. No, no. If so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been preached and taught every. 